Konnichiwa. Today I'm going to discuss some of the key trends affecting the packaging industry and also present some examples of innovation which will demonstrate the versatility, functionality and sustainability of plastics. The global packaging industry generates sales in excess of 770 billion US dollars. According to Smithers Pyra, this will grow to $930 billion in 2020. Growth in plastics packaging looks set to grow by 5.35% a year to reach $330 billion in 2020. So plastics represents 33% of the packaging industry. If you also consider that 75% of packaging production is consumed by 20% of the world's population, then you can see the potential for growth in developing countries where considerable amounts of food is wasted. This is reflected in the flexible packaging market, which has its largest share in developing regions such as India and China. A growing number of liquid-based brands are adopting flexible packaging formats because of their convenience. I think we'll continue to see great advancements in film construction, pouch forming equipment and dispensing technologies. And in my opinion, if you want to see real innovation in liquid packaging, you go to Japan. 60% of plastics packaging consumption is within the food sector. So trends and requirements in food innovation are centering on convenience, shelf life and environmental footprint or sustainability. Take, for example, this innovative beetroot pack launched in the UK by retail giant Marks & Spencer. It satisfies a consumer demand for smaller portion sizes by providing a rigid container to protect the product with a resealable film lid to ensure the food stays fresher for longer. It's not groundbreaking technology, but the creative use of the latest adhesive technology has enabled the brand to cater for consumer concerns. Speaking of innovation, this is the Wrist Drink Bottle by Gualia Packaging Group. It's for super cool people on the go. It comes supplied with a free sweatband. It brings new meaning to the term hands-free. There's also a trend for easier to open packaging formats due to ageing populations. Having said that, on the flip side you want packaging that can't be tampered with. Finding child-resistant packaging that's easy to open for adults remains an ongoing challenge. I like this quote. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Alan Kay refers to the development here of a truly personal computer. But I see this happening every single day in the plastics packaging industry. Speaking of personalisation, we've seen Coca-Cola make a big PR splash with its personalised labels, which are made possible with digital printing technology. In fact, it's fair to say that this groundbreaking project catapulted digital printing into the packaging mainstream. HP Indigo, which provided the digital print technology for the project, has certainly benefited. The company has introduced the HP Indigo 20,000 digital press, to bring digital printing to medium-sized flexible packaging converters, active in short runs below 5,000 square metres. HP Indigo cites the flexible packaging market as representing 34% of global retail packaging, valued at $68 billion, with growth of 6%. Now, when it comes to the invention of new solutions in the plastics packaging industry, I like to use the term technology enablers. Machinery advancements and material science developments are enabling the industry to move forward at a rapid pace. Substitution. The replacement of glass or metal by barrier plastics is hardly a new trend, but science has moved us to a point where a real breakthrough is plausible. There are fewer compromises now required when changing materials. The clear can by US-based Cortec is a great example of this. Launched earlier this year, it uses co-injection technology to create a multi-layer injection moulded clear plastic can. The structure here is EVOH, sandwiched between two layers of polypropylene, and it can be retorted at up to 130 degrees Celsius. It also has a metal end, so really it's a hybrid packaging format. The real technology enabler here was getting the seam between the metal and the plastics to survive stress. 
but it also required Curare, the supplier of the EVOH barrier, to develop new copolymer grades that could be co-injected, but that are also resistant to moisture shock. And while this barrier container seeks to substitute metal packaging, another converter was doing something slightly different, but quite similar. A combination, you could say, of evolution and revolution. European converter Weidenhammer, which recently agreed to be bought by US company Sunoco, has a polypropylene container with a metal end, which, instead of using EVOH, achieves its barrier through a proprietary in-mould label that features a clear window so you can see the product inside. In this case, it's Sprats from Eastern Europe, and it has a shelf life of two years. As the company said to me, two years is plenty of shelf life for such a product, which is a good point. People should eat the product and not collect it. A similar substitution is taking place in the flexible packaging business, led by Barrier Films Innovations. In the retour area, for example, Japan's Toyo Seikan has achieved an oxygen barrier similar to that of aluminium foil by applying a one micron layer of Canopass on a substrate film. The product under development here is called Oxidec and it will provide a shelf life of three years for oxygen sensitive foods and cosmetics. The complexity of all the requirements for packaging has boosted the global packaging machinery market so that it reached $54 billion in 2013. China inevitably dominates the machinery industry, with Turkey also emerging. More developed counterparts such as Germany, Italy, the US and Japan continue to stagnate. In fact, Chinese production of packaging machinery was $24 billion last year, three times higher than Germany, the second largest producer of packaging machinery in the world. Just as digital printing is moving forward, gravure is also improving, with high-resolution gravure systems now able to lift resolution for print up to 1,200 lines per inch. Printpack unveiled products displaying such print quality earlier this year. A potentially industry-changing technology enabler was announced recently by Australian firm Amcor, which has spent a decade developing Liquiform. Following collaboration with machinery manufacturer Seidel and Japanese bottle converter Yoshino, we could see Liquiform emerge on the market within two years. The system uses the liquid itself as a blowing medium, trimming manufacturing costs by up to 30%. Energy costs. The majority of technology enablers in the machinery business focus on the reduction of energy costs. This is a major area of concern for flat-out converters. Just prior to this exhibition, for example, US-based Plastic Technologies Incorporated, which works in the PET package area, said it was embarking on a plan to help bottle producers reduce their energy costs. Energy cost reductions can come from many areas of the production line, of course, such as air delivery and demand for blow moulding, the monitoring and maintenance of optimal process settings, the reduction of downtime, and oven control. Collaboration. In an increasingly global industry, companies continue to seek new ways of growing geographically. In addition to traditional joint ventures or licensing agreements, I've seen entire sectors or regions working together for a common goal. One example is European thermoforming machinery suppliers, who in the face of a real competitive threat from Turkish machinery makers, set aside their competitive differences to work together on maintaining their share of the market. One area was making it easier for converters to use tooling from several European suppliers rather than forcing them to rely on a single supplier. Back to Plastic Technologies Incorporated, it recently entered into an agreement with Japan's Toyo Seikan to introduce the Japanese firm's new processing technologies to a US audience. One of the areas they'll work together on is foamed PET bottle technology. In Europe, global brand owner Unilever introduced a body wash in multi-layer extrusion blow moulded bottles featuring mucell foam technology in the middle of polyethylene layers. This was to reduce bottle weight. Unilever's even agreed to waive exclusivity rights by January 2015 to allow competing manufacturers to use the technology, effectively benefiting an entire sector. Lightweighting. 
While foamed PET promises a lightweighting solution from a technology-enabling point of view, many brands sought to lightweight their products with a scattergun approach, squeezing every gram out of their bottles until they broke. Nestle water bottles springs to mind in this instance. Seidel developed the right weight, which was named as such to highlight the fact that lightweighting a bottle should not compromise the integrity of the bottle performance or the consumer experience. The right weight bottle weighs 7.5 grams, whereas the average weight of a 50 centiliter water bottle is 12 grams. Of course, you cannot discount the value of the brand when discussing packaging trends. I've noticed a spate of historical brands playing on this by launching classic products such as Retro Coca-Cola or Dr Pepper's August launch of a retro glass bottle and nostalgic motif. One significant trend is the continued rise of social media. Packaging can play a key role in brand reinforcement or, for that matter, failure. Juice brand Odwalla took a hit from consumers on social media recently over its decision to replace HDPE bottles with PET ones. Why? The reason is because the HDPE bottles, launched in 2011, were made using plant bottle material, while the new, clear bottles are made using standard PET. Online consumers were furious with Coca-Cola, the owner of Odwalla, with one criticising their shift back to petroleum bottles. Odwalla's view, of course, was quite different, They said that the larger, clear bottles deliver a more premium brand identity. And of course, it's only possible at the moment to include up to 30% plant-based content in PET bottles. This brings us on to the subject of bioplastics. Here the question is increasingly about whether to go bioplastic, which is materials made from biomass or plant matter, or biodegradable plastic which is usually petroleum-based plastics that partly degrade and decay through natural means on a compost heap. The former bioplastic variety is more likely to be the future, in my opinion, drop-in solutions like the plant bottle. And who knows, we might even see flexible and rigid plastics manufactured using algae. US firm Algix has formulated algae polymer compositions that are targeted to be drop-in replacements for thermoplastic resins, and packaging is one option here. It would also be remiss of me not to include the issue of recycling when we talk about trends. All plastics are recyclable, of course, if the right technology is invested in, and things are changing rapidly on a global level when it comes to recycling. Although PET recycling rates are growing across Europe, recent figures show what a huge disparity still exists in collection rates amongst European member states. Of course, if you collect too much packaging waste without the infrastructure to recycle it, you can end up with a failed recycling plant, like Coca-Cola and United Resource Recovery Corporation's South Carolina USA facility. But just recently, we see new plants being built in New Zealand, South Africa and the US, all geared at producing food-grade material. The recycling industry has enormous untapped potential. Coca-Cola, undeterred by its South Carolina disappointment, has recently announced massive investment plans for Mexico, and these include recycling. And a big topic of discussion in Europe right now is the drive towards a circular economy. Industry trade bodies are working together to try and recycle more municipal and packaging waste and ban the burial of recyclable waste in landfill by 2025. Now Europe could probably learn a thing or two from China, which has had circular economy legislation in place for decades, and Japan, which passed a circular economy law in 2002 called the Sound Material Cycle Law. Asia is, in essence, streets ahead of the rest of the world.